Welcome everyone. This is so fun. Uh, so we have, uh, my name is Puneet. I'm the founder CEO of Natomi. Um, but more importantly, we have our guest speaker of the year, Nick Mehta here, uh, founder and CEO of Gainsight. Nick, so excited to have you. Hey Puneet, great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, no, this is amazing. So we'll be talking about the future of customer experience. We'll be talking about what would it look like in 2022. So we have an action-packed agenda for you. Awesome. Yeah. Nick, how are you feeling as the year is coming to a close? How, how's this year been like? Well, I'm feeling, I'm feeling great now. Actually, over the weekend, I got my booster shot, and now I have all my energy back. It sat, it sat me out of my energy, but I'm very lucky to have, have a booster and be immunized. On, on the work front, uh, it's awesome. I mean, just I think all of us in software are just very lucky and privileged to be in the software industry where yeah. all of us, you know, you every time I'm like, wow, we're doing such a great job. And then I meet every software CEO. It's like everything is on fire, right? But we're going to yeah. talk a lot about why, you know, customer experience and what we do customer success has really benefited for many different reasons um, from the, what's happened over the last few years. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, similar experience here. You know, we, we are obviously... Um, a younger company, we raised our Series B, the announcement came out yesterday. I know, congratulations, that's amazing. Oh, oh thank you, thank you so much. And, uh, uh, you know, this AI thing that used to be a toy a couple of years ago and everybody was like, oh, will, will AI ever have a spread conversation? And yeah. today, you know, um, I, I think the, the pandemic got us over that, that hump and now it's, uh, it's real, it's here, it's, uh, you know, along with self-driving cars and whatnot. I love it, that's awesome. Great. So, so jumping right into the agenda, talking about what's coming, what's happening. Um, you know, one of the things, Nick, that uh, we often talk about is what is happening to customer experience in this post-pandemic, post-COVID world? You know, what has changed? It, it feels like something has changed, you know, fundamentally in the fabric of interaction as we have gotten used to the Zoom style life, as we have gotten used to you know, um, going and maybe even living at different places. What are you seeing in your world? What has changed? Yeah, I think there's three things that have changed. And one's unique to our world. And I think two apply to all your customers as well. So mm -hmm. I think the two that apply to everyone, one is that um, because all of a sudden, pretty much most human beings in the world, not, not everyone was fortunate enough, but most human beings switched to a very digital lifestyle. And they basically just like, got into digital being the default mechanism of communicating and working, whether it's through apps and ordering food or, you know, you know, kind of, you know, uh, staying in Airbnbs, as you talked about, you know, Netflix, obviously, just living your life online. And I think that's actually caused people when they're dealing with uh, a, a kind of either vendors or customer experiences to expect a digital first customer experience and really, really kind of an, a very intelligent customer experience. So that's the first thing that's happened. I think the second thing is, uh, you know, COVID and, and everything that's related with supply chain and everything else has caused this incredible variance in demand, right? Like all of a sudden demand stopped on March, March 2 at 2020, and then it started picking up, then it skyrocketed, then supply chain issues hit, things get shut down, they get started again. Pe you know, people's also now with like even uh, orthogonal to COVID, all of the incredible like just uh, crazy fads and changes in, in like some, all of a sudden I, I was reading like, Brussels sprouts were really hot on TikTok one week. And <laughs> Brussels sprouts ran out in grocery stores. Like that's a funny thing. Oh. Modern life. So the variability of demand is causing companies to have to figure out how do we scale up and down our customer experience really quickly, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that's true for my customers. I think probably for yours as well. And then the third one, which is a, probably a little more unique to my, my business, we, we um, primarily sell to software companies. So our customers are the software companies who want to deliver great experiences to their customers and also deliver great outcomes to their customers. That, that's called customer success. That's the term people use. And they want to do that because they want to keep their customers and they also want to grow their customers, get them to spend more money. And so this concept of customer success is totally blown up because software has blown up. The number of software companies, I'm sure you see it, Panit, just it is just staggering. I mean, tens of thousands of software companies that are legit businesses now, you know, probably yeah. about a thousand unicorn private companies, you know, like there's like uh, 15 software companies over a hundred billion of market cap. There's dozens over 10 billion of market cap. It is yeah. just mind boggling. You know, Microsoft's worth 2.5 trillion, right? Like, so the, everything in software has blown up. So those three things, you know, kind of the digital first customer experience being the preference for people an intelligent digital first, the need to scale up and down quickly in terms of customer experience. And then the fact that software is eating the world as, as Mark Andreessen said back, you know, 12 years ago, and it's really happening. Yeah, yeah, no, those are some really amazing insights. 
And um, yeah, it feels like we live in a very different world. Yeah, oh. this this could have taken five or ten years to get here, and the pandemic got us here in two. Um, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah on, on on our side, Nick, we're seeing something quite similar. Um, so we we are an AI platform for customer experience for customer service. So companies use uh, Netomi's AI to automate interactions with their customers so that they can serve them in the moment, like instantly when they need them. Um, so we went through kind of that that interesting transition. You know, when the pandemic hit, one of our largest customers is an airline. Their traffic grew forty five fold. You know, because yeah. people are like, "Am I traveling? Am I not?" Traveling? Right. Am I rebooking? Am I canceling? You know, do I need a mask? So, and suddenly they were like, how do we support this with a people only workforce? And everybody was feeling really burdened. Um, and that's when our AI started addressing, you know, over 80% of the questions that these uh, this airlines customers were asking and, and everybody felt helped. And that was the idea, you know, I think we always, uh, pre-pandemic, there was this thought process that in order to build connection you need to have you know two people talking. You need to connect customers with your agents. And I think that suddenly the definition of that connection has changed. The definition of connection is instant help. You know, yep. the definition of connection is gaining better understanding. So that's the first thing that we have seen change is kind of the, that definition of connection is now being helpful in the moment. Um, and that's being appreciated and leverage of leveraging technology in that context is being appreciated. You know, the second thing, uh, like you mentioned, the effect of the global supply chain slowdown. Um, so in 2022, whether we want it or not, we're going to have more support tickets than we used to. Yeah. So like whether it's Brussels sprouts running out and people point. calling and being like, well, you know, when do I get my, Where are my uh, Brussels, Brussels sprouts? sprouts? Come on, bring them to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Or, or it's my pair of headphones that I ordered and still not delivered for three yep. months or, you know, like it's going, we're going to have so many of those things. Um, so that's the second change we are seeing is going into 2022 support teams are preparing for this global supply chain slowdown and, and more tickets. Um, and as things open up, whether even in travel, right, like what are the new rules? What is the new normal? There's just going to be a lot of questions um, to ensure safety. And the third thing that we kind of saw um, a big shift in is that this has started getting attention at a very senior level. Um, so, you know, there's C-level execs thinking about this. There was a New York Times story recently on, um, you know, specifically airlines on, you know, how people are not upset that the planes are not in the air. They're upset when you are put on hold. They're upset yeah. when they don't get answers. You know, it's, it's kind of surprising. They're like, hey, you know, I, I get it. It's a global pandemic. You know, I can wait at the airport for four hours as long as you tell me what's going on. Oh. Uh, so that's getting the attention of very senior level execs who are stepping in and who are, you know, bringing in that digital transformation. So yeah, yeah very, very when different. They say, when they say it's due to us unusually high call volume, I, 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 that's, just not, that's just not true. It's not unusually high call volume. They just <laughs> haven't figured out how to scale. Right? Yeah, that's, yeah. that's really what's happening. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I love it. I think that's so right. And I feel like because of scale is the word I hear over mm -hmm. and over and over again across all industries, scale, scale, scale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so we have, you know, 300-ish people with us today. We would love to hear from you as well, from everybody in the audience. Um, you know, do you see customers' expectations change, um, you know, in, in your area? So so let's, let's maybe bring up the polls. We'd love to hear from everyone. Um, so you'll, you'll all see a question on your screen come up. Um, if the customer expectations from my company post pandemic have somewhat changed, changed drastically, not changed. Who wants to be a millionaire? <laughs> <laughs> I'll give it another 30 seconds for everybody to respond. I see a ton of answers coming in. Okay, so let's see, what did everybody say? All right, so we have somewhat changed at 57%, changed drastically at 36%, not changed at only 6%, wow. So Nick, everybody's seeing this. Yeah. That's 90% that's plus, wow. Super interesting. It's possible, yeah. by the way, some of the pe people that are seeing less change, maybe you already were ahead of the curve, even pre-pandemic. So that's possible. That's very true. Yeah. That's very true. Amazing. Um, great. So as we make our way into, you know, kind of the, the second thing I want to talk about today is, yeah, 
demystifying this whole idea of customer experience you know i, I think it means i still means different things to different people is it the idea that you survey your customers and understand their needs is it that you help them in the moment you know is it that you build a program for them um what what's your take on this like you know how, how do we how, how do you unpack customer experience but i think everybody would love to hear yeah, totally. And we, you know, we, again, I have a lens that's pretty unique, which is we're mainly dealing with B2B businesses. So, you know, and you're dealing obviously with a lot of big c- consumer contact centers. So I think we can kind of jointly answer this question. In yeah. the world I experience um, that we, we define kind of a broader concept called customer success. And mm-hmm. the idea of customer success is you want to make your customers successful with your products or services, right? And, and success in the way we define it, we, all, we would write an equation that says CS equals CO plus CX. The, mm. the CX is customer experience. I'll describe that in a second. The CO is customer outcomes. So, you know, at the end of the day, you know, when I'm calling that airline, I want to have a good experience with that airline. And I want to actually, you know, travel in a timely fashion and safely. And I want to get to my, you know, in a, in a reasonable price point and everything else. Right. And so obviously when somebody buys a B2B product, they're, you know, they're trying to do something. They're trying to drive more revenue for their business. They're trying to make their employees happier. They're trying to reduce their downtime, right? I'm sure you have outcomes that you, you promise your customers as well. And so the idea is customer success is outcomes plus experience. Now let's click into the experience area. Experience is a very well-defined and well-researched area, but I'm with you, Panit, that like sometimes people look at pieces of it and think it's the whole thing. So clearly part of experience is measuring, you know, how you're doing. And, you know, obviously there's, surveys. Surveys are just part of the story now. Most people understand you. There's things you can do inside an application in the moment. You can look at, you know, text feedback, even without a survey, you can, uh, the biggest thing now is looking at their digital behavior, right? So it's not, you know, some of their experience is not just what they say, but what they do, right? And, and, but it's not just about monitoring the experience. It's about designing that ideal journey. Um, and then actually looking at the data on where you are today and then iterating on the journey and having a program to optimize it constantly over time, right? And then using all the channels like what you guys do to help deliver that journey in the way that makes sense for that customer. Yeah. And I think one of the biggest things that we've learned, I think you guys learned too, is each customer's preferences on their journey and their 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 you know communication style and all that is different. Mm-hmm. And it changes time to time too. Certain situations, one human being might want to do more of a phone-based interaction versus a text message versus self-service on a website versus email, et cetera. So, yeah. So I think it, for us, it customer success is kind of an umbrella that includes experience and outcomes. Oh, that, that makes perfect sense. You know, I, I love that way of unpacking the equation as well. Um, you know, I, I think it also gives teams the opportunity to, to look at these at two different KPIs and, 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 you know, kind of uh, marry them together into, into one goal, which is at the end of the day, we all want to make our customers happy, make them successful. Exactly. Make things successful. And, totally. and make them feel successful too. That's right. Um, you know, that's a good point, by the way. It's not just that they are, they have to feel that way and you have to show them the success that they're having. You know, some of the best like consumer apps now send you these emails about all the workouts you did on Peloton or all, yeah. the, all the songs you listen to, right? So you get to see like what you're doing and reinforce that positivity. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. Um, and, and then, um, you know, what we're seeing in the customer experience um, and the customer support world specifically, as you rightly mentioned, is um, especially post-pandemic, it is the conversations have gotten very goal-driven. Yeah. So, so I think, uh, you know, there was a time when people would pick up the phone and call and they were patient and they wanted to, you know, sometimes there'll be small talk um, and, and they would appreciate that. You know, I think somehow, because a lot of people have been in their houses, have been indoor and, and just haven't had that much social interaction. You know, it's funny, we would expect the opposite where we would be like, oh, maybe they'll appreciate that social interaction with the support agent, but, they, but they're wanting to get to the point and they're, they're Interesting. Interesting their patients. And we are noticing this in data across the board. Um, and, and, and what's funny is going back to that first point on, you know, how, do, how are people defining good customer experience? It's, the, it's at least the year that's coming, I think it's going to be about um, understand that I'm standing on a street corner with an umbrella in my hand means I, I want immediate help. I'm yeah. sitting on my couch on a Saturday afternoon texting with you, you know, maybe I have a little more patience. That's a good so point. just that understanding of, uh, of context and understanding of that situational awareness, I think has gotten to be more important than ever before. You know, people that. going to the airports, 
you know, asking for help. If I'm about to stand in line, I'm like, hey, you know, I, I need to know the rules here. So I need some help. So I think this whole idea of customer experience spanning across digital and physical touch points, where even in physical spaces, I think we have that opportunity to provide that digital help constantly now. That's a brilliant, brilliant point. Um, awesome. So, so Nick, as we kind of go into this, this third section of uh, talking about applying automation to customer experience, um, you know, I, I know you, you pretty much defined this whole customer success space and you've had very early viewpoints on what's a good point or what's a good touch point for applying automation, what's not a good touch point, what's a, you know, what does success look like in that area? But what, what are you noticing in the customer success world when we talk about automation? Yeah, I think a couple of things that, uh, that really uh, are impactful. Number one is that um, automation actually for a lot of uh, consumers and customers is good for them too. Right. So they, you know, we all, we, not all of us, but a lot of people enjoy that self-service experience. You know, for example, um, you know, when you call Comcast, which is not, you know, nothing against Comcast, but we call a cable company. It's never, never yeah. you're never fun because you're usually it's because your internet's not working, your TV's not working or whatever. Right. Yeah. And I think a lot, a lot of these services now they'll like automatically try to diagnose on the phone through like technology and reset your modem. And I think that's super cool. You know, I think it's really great. And I think we are all, many of us are appreciating the chance to kind of self-service because yeah. we're becoming more technical as a, as a society, as humanity, right? We just are like, you have to, you are, it's just happening. And yeah. so I think that's one thing, the automation is, is actually maybe historically had some bad connotation, like an IVR or a really poor speech recognition or whatever. And it feels like things are, there's some positives coming out of it and people are appreciating that, some certain people. Second thing is, I think in, in the B2B world I serve, people, um, you know, historically would say we're going to do a digital kind of customer success for our small customers and for our big customers going to be very high touch. Yeah. And what's happening is digital customer success, digital experience is actually a strategy that can apply to all your customers, mm -hmm. not to all touch points. Because mm -hmm. sometimes I really do want to talk to somebody on the phone, right? Like sometimes yeah. I'm, especially in that example you're talking about where you're going through an airport and there's something like confusing happening and you know that like the website won't help you and you want to talk to somebody on the phone, but there are many times when you actually really would love to do it digitally. And so rather than saying certain customers based on a spend level are digital and certain ones are human touch, rather making it, like you said, based on where they are, what their circumstances it, and, and sort of thinking it through it, through it that way. Um, the third thing is I think that clearly digital experiences um, are uh, kind of powered by AI, but also power AI in that, <laughs> By having it like a digital experience can like you like what you guys do can actually be better um, improved through AI. But yeah. the more digital experiences you have, the better the AI can get because yeah. now the system can get trained and learn and all that. And so the companies that are actually creating digital experience for their customers, not only are they scaling and maybe leveraging some AI, they're actually building a data set to make their AI better and also to make it kind of proprietary. So digital experience is both the start and end of AI from my vantage point. Yeah, no, those are some really amazing points. And, and I'm sure, you know, very thought provoking for the audience. So if, if the audience has any questions, you know, I, I know, you know, Nick just uh, dropped a, a lot of wisdom, a lot of knowledge on us. So, you know, don't, don't forget to type in your questions and we'll make sure we, we cover those at the end. Um, so yeah, re really amazing points, Nick. You know, especially uh, you agree with uh, the, the last one you said, we see this in, on an everyday basis. It's like, you know, the, this AI experience is just starting to get so much better because it's seeing so many situations in real life. You know, just like the self-driving car. Totally. You know, once it has driven uh, a, you know, a million miles, it, it might start driving in, in some conditions, not every condition, like you said. In some conditions, it might start driving better than the human driver because you're not limited to two eyes and a couple of years. You're, you know, you can have cameras everywhere and you can have situational awareness. You know the road conditions in advance. You know when it's raining, how much is it going to rain. It's like... You know, it, it, it can get really smart. Um, you know, it's funny, somebody was asking me last week um, on our team, they're like, how do you define AI when it comes to customer experience? <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, uh, you know, AI is like the raw ingredient, but the idea is, you know, if I was to say, you know, A stands for access and I stands for intimacy. So what we are trying to do is build or deliver that combination of access and intimacy between businesses and their customers. So we should have that end goal in mind. You know, we shouldn't do this as a science experiment. This is not a research project to, to create an AI that can talk like people. 
like the, at the end of the day, it's very goal driven. It's to you know provide that access twenty four seven and build that intimacy, build that trust. I love that access and intimacy. That's a really good way of saying it. Awesome. Um, great. So, so you know, for, for everyone again in the audience, another quick reminder: don't forget to send in your questions. Um, you know, because we we will cover a bunch of questions at the end. Um, you know, Nick, as you as you think about um, you know twenty twenty two, you know, this is this is my favorite section now, um, and I know you 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 know, you're you're so forward thinking. You love to talk about how things would be in the future. But what what do you think this whole thing would look like? You know, what what are the top forecasts? for 2022, maybe even beyond. Yeah, yeah I, I, I'm sure all of us have been humbled in our ability to forecast anything, right? I'm sure you feel the same way, right? Even literally, what am I doing tomorrow is, is pretty pretty up in the air. But um, I think one, one thing that uh, I'm seeing a lot of is, you know, people have built digital products, uh, right? Tons of, you know, great digital products, whether they're software, SaaS, mobile, web, devices, embedded, everything. And then you've got um, this kind of digital customer experience of some kind, right? Whether it's a chat, chat bot, or website or whatever. I, I think that, you know, there's definitely going to continue to be a blending where people do more of the digital experience in the product. Um, because the more the customer or consumer is living in the product, the more they'd expect the experience for getting help to be in the product. You know, and I think that's something that historically we kind of thought of these as two different things, yeah. you know, your, your product, and then you have your, your phone number, right? Um, but now I think people want that digital experience to uh, kind of customer experience to be, be embedded in the digital product experience. So that's an area that I think people are spending a lot of time on. We actually make a technology in that area where we like let you embed kind of like, you know, help and guides and stuff like that into an app. And mm -hmm. it's really taken off because people are saying, how do I actually embed a customer experience into my our product? We actually call it Gateside product experience because it's all about building an experience into your product versus making the customer go somewhere else, right? That's yeah. an area I think that's a very, seems to be really taking off right now. A uh, second one, which we've already talked about, and it's sort of lame to call uh, AI a prediction because it's every year's prediction. But I do think that like it's it's just more real. I'm sure you feel the same way, Pete, right? Like it's more real right now. Um, it's not just buzzwords. People are really doing it. Um, yep. I think companies are really trying to get a better handle on their strategy, but also using AI to show the e efficacy of the investments they're putting in. Because lots of times people struggle with what's the ROI of, let's say, for example, in my world, having a customer success manager work with a customer, what's the ROI of that? Well, now that people are tracking everything they're doing and they have digital experiences, they can now actually use AI to sort of say what's causal. Like we, we actually have a, a feature that we were just releasing in a couple months that'll like analyze all the activities you're taking, which ones are correlated with higher NPS, higher renewal rates, et cetera. So using AI to help you determine what's working and what's not versus the classic business world, which is kind of just guessing and you know, judgment and intuition and things like that. So AI to help make better decisions, I think is an interesting area that people are spending a lot of time on. Um, if I give third one, it's probably, I, it's, I saw a question around this too, which is like, it's, it's sort of how do you keep that human element in mm -hmm. this digital experience. Uh, you know, we talk again about this idea of human first business. And yeah. I think that as much as the pandemic accelerated digital transformation, it also kind of in a kind of maybe strangely paradoxical way has actually created more need for human interaction yeah. and for finding ways to kind of humanize these interactions. And I'll go back to like using TikTok as the example, because I, I, mean, I think you can learn so much from these sort of next gen consumer technologies. You know, oh, totally. TikTok is, has really like, created a whole new humanized way that people communicate, right? And you watch the engagement on that app, it's just incredible and the way yeah. people connect to each other. And so I think we have to constantly find ways to let our customers connect in ways that feel, that might be digital from a scale perspective, but yeah. feel very human. Mm -hmm. No, that's amazing. Yeah, I, I think I think this entire trend, Instagram Reels, TikTok, you know, we, um, it, it's, it's interesting when, when we talk to customers that are kind of enabling this new layer of commerce, um, you know, what they're noticing, uh, and I think we are we're getting into some of the, um, I think this might be a shared prediction from both sides, this, uh, this entire idea of, of high trust commerce. And, you know, you see a lot of these content creators, a lot of these influencers launching micro brands on yeah. TikTok, you know, and, and they have no ambitions to be, you know, a $50 billion brand. They're like, I'm, I'm happy being, you know, a $10 million brand and having a loyal following and, you know, I'm going to sell my protein powder to people that love my protein powder. I'm, I'm going to sell these, uh, you know, 
scented candles. So it's 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 crazy. I think uh, you know the the pandemic and the lockdown has just created this new way of interacting, which we just just did not have. Totally, the whole Shopify revolution, right? It's just changed everything. Shopify is a two hundred billion dollar market cap company for a reason because of yeah. all these micro brands and micro retailers. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, so yeah, you know, from from my side, I think uh, that's kind of the, the the first one when it comes to thinking about the next year is this high trust commerce is just going to take off. Um, you know, on one side, we obviously have that Amazon style model, the marketplace model where, you know, when, when I already have established trust, let's say when I buy from Amazon, I trust the brand, I trust the review system. I trust the prime model that if they say it's going to get delivered in, in two days, it will. Um, but in this case, it's a very different way. It's a very different trust fabric. You know, it feels quite right. different. It's, it touches you so much closer. I love it. It's such a, such a good point. Yeah. And, and then the second one, um, you know, I think links into the labor shortages. Yeah. You know, yeah we are, we're all experiencing this today. You know, if you look at uh, contact center, call center, the, the world that we live in, um, the, the turnover rate right now is 45%. You know, that's like, imagine one in two people leaving in the next six months. Wow. And, and there are 25% less people in the hiring pool right now for, for support agents, for contact centers. You know, overseas shutdowns with BPOs has not helped at all. So, so I just think that combining that with this global supply chain slowdown is just going to, you know, we'll, we'll have a lot of AI adoption happening. Maybe we go from, I think right now AI adoption is maybe at single digit percent, five-ish, four, five, if I had to guess. Um, we might get to 70, 75 just in the next 18 months. So, so a, a lot of uh, a lot of self-driving customer care coming. I love that. Uh, yeah. On that great, I mean, to me, that great designation point is it's it's sort of like this uh, cycle that happens because now mm -hmm. what's happening is you know all this great digital experience is out there and it's causing all these this incredible amount of uh, job mobility, frankly, and yeah. what that's causing is people to you know switch jobs and leave the workforce and all that. And that's causing companies to say, we can't be so people dependent anymore because yeah. we can't scale, but also we don't even have the people. So we yeah. need to invest more in digital. So it's actually yeah. this loop, right? You invest more in digital, loop. creates more labor mobility, causes more people to move jobs. Companies yeah. invest more in digital over yeah. and over again. And that's why, why AI and digital experiences are, they, they're just happening by default now. <laughs> yeah, no, fully agree. You know, that, what, what you just said, it links into the third one, which is, yeah, I think uh, we'll have a lot more customer experience execs have have seat at the table in the boardroom. Totally. And, and you know, kind of make decisions on how these businesses are run fundamentally differently. Um, you know, we're looking at um, kind of this going from this idea of that this is a resource intensive, you know, limited pool methodology of doing things manually to now saying you take this thing you know scarce resource and you make it almost infinitely abundant by adding you know ai to the fabric what do you do with that do you invent new business models you know does everybody become a subscription business because yeah. you can have infinite conversations at near zero cost you know does everything start running on you know a, a blockchain style model now that you can actually quantify trust with ai That's so exactly. i think uh, i think it's going to be a fun fun time to be living in but my, you know, my, my favorite um, one, though, is uh, when do you think the next season of Ted Lasso is coming? You know, is, is that looks? <laughs> we, I, I, basically, I'm just buying time till that happens because I, I, all this other stuff is, is, uh, is just a distraction to, to learning from Ted Lasso, learning for the master. So I can't wait. You, you, Batman. I think, you know, same, same boat. I'm just uh, one day at a time. Let's see when is season three out. I love it. Awesome. So I know we have, uh, you know, we have another poll where we would love everybody's feedback. You know, we've been talking a lot about customer experience. We've been talking about automation. We would love to see what you are all seeing in your organizations when it comes to applying automation. So let's launch the poll here from everyone. So you should see a question on your screens, um, which says, my company uses AI in our customer experience program. And again, um, there's a yes, there's a no, or we are exploring. Wow, I see a lot of answers pouring in. That's amazing. We'll give it another maybe 15 seconds. Wow, I already see the raw data. This is, this is amazing. Okay, let's see the results. All right. So we have 29% of the people say they've already started using it. You know, 20% 
um, don't use it, and over half are exploring AI. But what do you think about that, Dick? That that's quite telling. Yeah, I think this just shows that how, how I think the maturity of like you know, there's a lot more yeses than would have been a few years ago, and then yeah. there's a lot a lot more people that are exploring than would have been a few years ago. So I think just the that's the maturity curve, kind of like. Some of you have probably read the book Crossing the Chasm by Jeffrey Moore. It's, it's just yeah. crossing, it's crossing the chasm now. It already has crossed the chasm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, exciting times. Um, awesome. So, you know, in, in, the, in the next part, um, I think we've, we've talked about quite a few things. Um, now we want to talk about um, mistakes. You know, when, when we kind of explore new things, we charter, you know, go and, and, and go into uncharted territories. There are mistakes, there are learnings. Um, you know, and, and, and you're an expert at this. So what, what would you say are kind of some, some of the top takeaways when it comes to uh, mistakes we should share so others don't make the same ones? I'd like to point out, you, you rightfully stated that I'm an expert in mistakes, which is definitely true. I'm definitely an expert in making mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I would say that um, the, the biggest, if I can just give you one, it, it's, I think in this customer experience area, area, it's easy to fall into a trap of platitudes. Mm -hmm. customers are so important. They really matter. All that matters is their experience. We care about them. And that's nothing wrong with that. But I mean, those platitudes are, are worth the cost of saying, they're worth the price of saying them, which is nothing, right? Every company says mm. that, right? It's just so, it's so uh, almost, it's so vapid, right? Yeah. Um, I, to me, a big thing is measurement and mm -hmm. not just measurement of like the high level experience, for example, net promoter score, or customer effort score. That's no brainer. You should do that. Yeah. But measurement of all of the entire process and then be able to like demonstrate the impact and be able to go to your CFO who probably doesn't believe the same as you about inherent need of customer experience, right? They believe in the inherent need of EBITDA, right? Or profit. And so how do you go to that CFO and be able to, with data, show the ROI of what you're doing, right? Yeah. The ROI of your program. You, as a customer experience professional, need to become an expert in ROI from my vantage point. Mm -hmm. Wow. No, that, that's, that's really amazing advice. Yeah, you know, it's something, something we say as well. We are like, start with the ROI first and you'll know what are the things you should attempt. Yeah, exactly. yeah. And, um, and it's funny, you know, I, think, uh, I think you hit the nail on the head with that, that, that idea that start, start with you know, what would create um, that, that right kind of outcome. You know, one of the things that we have noticed, um, and I think you started with this, was people tend to get lost when they think about customer experience, right? We, we have, we've had companies uh, be sold on these two-year digital transformation programs where, you know, there's slow moving parts that are, that are expected to magically come together in a couple of years and just start, you know, delivering the next generation um, CX. But um, yeah, so, so I would say in, from, from our side, what we have seen companies do is kind of find that wedge, find that little, you know, um, one part of customer experience that will have a disproportionate benefit, measure that ROI, and, and launch small, you know, think of like a 90 day program, like, is there something you can do to maybe improve by 5% in 90 days, you don't have, you don't need that 300% improvement that you got sold by the largest uh, management consulting companies and nothing against them. I think, it's a, I think it's just a different way of thinking. Um, and, um, and yeah, so, so I would say the, the biggest one that we have seen is the ability to start small measure and see if you can start having impact in, in under six months. I love that. Yeah. I think that measurement to me is like learning, actually learning the basics of statistics, learning how to, how measurement works, you know, where, for example, you know, one of our customers, recent customers is um, Atlassian. You probably know them. Atlassian makes course, Jira yeah. and all that, right. And one of the things they do incredibly in their business is they test everything, you know, like literally from the, the beginning of their company, when they were started in Australia, they're testing the landing page when you're trying to, download Jira and they're testing different copy, what people call A, B testing. And, and so they've okay. actually started applying that to customer experience and customer success. And I feel like a lot of people in the customer experience and customer success will just don't have the experience in you know, experimentation, testing, statistics, correlation, regression. This stuff isn't that complicated um, when yeah. you really when you dive into it, would spend, spend a few hours. And then you'll be so much more prepared for that conversation with your CFO about budgeting or, or the need for new technology or things like that. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a really interesting point. You know, it's almost like I think all the execs in this particular domain have to, you know, upskill a little bit to start looking at this as a business problem. Um, and, and, and because they anyways, whether they want it or not, they're going to have a seat at the table in the board. That's room. right. Yeah, exactly right. They have the seat now. It's there. Yeah, yeah. awesome. Um, great. So, you know, I think uh, before we jump to questions, any, any other 
you know, closing thoughts, Nick. I, I know we've discussed uh, a, a variety of different topics um, or, or, any, or any other fun things that you're looking forward to. No, no, I think that I, I just think in general that, the, like you said, the seat at the table is there. The career is, is legitimate and is, is getting to that seat level. Um, but yeah. I think one of the things that people realize when you get to the sea level is it's, it's a, temporarily you're like, yay, we're here. And they're like, wow, the expectations are really high. Yeah. So you have all earned a seat at the table, but now that's like, it comes with a cost. It's time to deliver, you know? So we yeah. all have to deliver, which is, that's a, you know, it's, they say, uh, there's a famous expression, uh, uh, heavy is the head that we're, where, where is the crown, right? You've, you've heard that know. And it's like, you know, once you get into leadership and you get the exposure, you're like, wow, these are hard decisions. And now I've got to be able to deliver. So I think on the whole customer experience and customer success industry, it's time to deliver. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's uh, I think it's it's never been a better time to be in this domain, um, yeah. you know, when, when it comes to future proofing your career. Um, you know, if you think about jobs five years from now, I think it's all going to be about people that can, you know, build that access and intimacy, you know, use technology in the right way. And I think, uh, I think suddenly this, this entire area is so hot and so relevant, uh, living in a very different world. Awesome. Great. So with that, let's take some questions. I think we have quite a few. I'm going to read them off the screen. Okay. Um, so Nick, this one's for you. It says, uh, Nick, when thinking about automation and introducing digital experiences, can you provide some examples of how you might segment customers to decide who you should and should not, who should or should not be a part of the automated journey? Yeah, so I think there's a, a couple things you can do. Now, I, I live in the B2B world, so we're selling a company that have multiple people in the company, right? So one yeah. segmentation to me is um, at a persona level. There's some personas that are going to actually engage, like I'm sure, Penny, you know, you have some personas at your customer that are mm -hmm. in your quarterly business reviews that are meeting with, but there are other personas that realistically are not going to be. Maybe the senior executive could be an example of that. And so how do yeah. you catch that person in a moment where that makes sense when they're in the product, when they're in, in a dashboard, they're looking at something and maybe put up a little feedback button or whatever, yeah. right? So catching people where they're at, at a persona level, to me, that's an interesting area that, you know, we can, we can all do more. The second thing is I think we can watch the behavior of people. So the people that are in your application a lot, there's no need to actually have to email them or set up a meeting. You can get interact with them in that app. But the people that are not in your app, obviously that you can't use the application to connect with them. So you've got to go through a traditional model of email or chat yeah. or a text message or whatever, right? And so yeah. I think watching their behavior and maybe even using usage analytics to kind of profile them. What type of kind of communication style do they prefer? Right. Let's, we can almost, you can imagine building a data mart that you're like, Hey, we're going to look at how often are they in our application? Do they, do they open our emails? Are they responding to our emails? Have they called support lately? Let's guess what their preferred method is and let's make that the default. Now yeah. they can always change that. Maybe we give them an option to change it, but how do you just kind of like auto personalize the channel based on what we've seen about that customer? Yeah, no, hundred percent. You know, we are seeing something very similar in the customer support world as well, both in B two B and B two C, where it's almost that uh, um, you know you you have to go by the persona. You you might have these very high value, you know, for the lack of a better word, call them platinum customers. If you are talking loyalty levels or something like that, or lifetime value, you know, and and maybe you have dedicated people that would talk to them every time they reach out. But maybe you're selling, you know, a, a $10 a month subscription product within the same company, a different SKU, and you can automate many of those interactions. Um, and then you can put them on, you know, kind of the tailored journeys where hopefully many of them become those platinum customers. But then you let the data do a lot of driving in that particular case. So yeah, seeing, seeing something very similar in, in our world as well. Um, great. So the next question, um, uh, you know, again, this one, for you, Nick, it says, have you noticed any trends in venture capital funding and their asks of customer success? Um, yeah. how, is, how is the VC world looking at customer success? Well, the trend in venture capital funding is there's a lot of it <laughs> everywhere, <laughs> all the time, every day. It's insane um, and exciting because it just software is growing so much. Yeah. But on customer success, 100% of investors now know that the one of the either the number one or number two metric that drives value of your company is what people call net dollar retention, which yep. is basically 
out of all the customers you have, take all the spending they have at the beginning of the year, and those same customers, without adding any new ones, how much are they spending at the end of the year? Are they growing? Are they shrinking in the existing customers? Net dollar retention is shown to be the number one or number two predictor of the multiple your stock will trade at if you're a public company. Mm-hmm. Because of that, every investor knows that net dollar retention is absolutely existential. And they know customer success is the key to that. So every yeah. investor I know is trying to help the company get a great customer leader, try customer success leader, trying to um, make sure they're investing the right amount. They're asking for advice on best practices. They're they're, they, they themselves are actually reading some some of the, our books and conferences and all that. And at a minimum, they're sending their teams to go do it. So yeah, investors are 100% bought into customer success now, which is very different than it was five, six years ago. So pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. no, I completely agree. We noticed that you know, as we um, raised our recent round as well, I think one of, the, one of the conversations that everybody wanted to have was, you know, who's buying more? Um, how yeah. successful are they being? You know, what are their metrics? How much? And, and then, you know, metrics obviously relate to that value created. And, and everybody was really interested in what kind of value got created. So, yeah, fully, that's fully a, agree with you. That's a good point. Yeah, everyone's getting savvy that the long term way to keep your customers is to drive more value. So, that's exactly right. Yeah, amazing. Um, great. So, the last one for today, um, you know, in a digital experience model, are there any surprising findings you've found with people who have tried this? Yeah, so it, digital experience, I think one thing that surprised me is, um, uh, we, so we actually even have a digital uh, team at Gainsight. And so we do a lot of this ourselves. And it's interesting, because I think that initially, if you have a very human-based approach, there's a little bit of a leap of faith to introduce digital. I think that's probably, you can, you can appreciate that too, Pani, right? Like there's a little bit of fear everyone has, including me, like all of us do, especially yeah. hear about customer experience a lot. You don't want to mess it up. And it's interesting. The surprising thing to me is how like certain types of customers just mm-hmm. gravitate towards it. And for them, it's actually better. They're just happier. And so I think yeah. that, so you've gone through that where you kind of, it's like, it's like jumping off the cliff and you don't feel like you have a parachute on you or whatever. Yeah. Too issue right but like you kind of feel like you don't i think that's probably the biggest surprise for me is honestly how much it works we we did a review today and you know of our our quarterly business reviews and our renewal rate we have a segment that is primarily like digital first for customers and they have the highest renewal rate in the company Mm, action bias because we put customers that are more likely to want digital into that segment so it's not like it would apply to everyone but it's it actually works um so even even for somebody who does it for a living it can be surprising sometimes yeah, no, that's that's really amazing. You know, that, that's what we noticed as well with our customers. You know, how many times they would be so amazed, and and uh, you know, it's funny. One of our one of our customers is is a large airline, and um, you know, they presented their AI on stage at their annual investor meeting. They were like, "We'll show you our newest employee." You know, the, here's here's somebody who does the work of six hundred people in our company, and it was. Uh, it was really amazing. I think they awesome. never expected that it'll start doing the work of 600 people in a 10,000 person company. And now, now they celebrate birthdays for this thing. So, so I think just the, the, you know, that, that initial hesitation and, but then the acceptance where, um, you know, larger than is celebrating Juliet's birthday and they just had this third birthday party um, this time on zoom, the first birthday party was 600 people invited with cake and everything. So, oh my gosh. That's so cute. I love that. That's a great story. <laughs> Happy birthday. AI. I love it. There we go. Uh, amazing. So I know we are at time. Um, you know, one quick announcement before we wrap this up. Um, I'm going to share my screen real quick. Is uh, thanks everybody for coming to the webinar. We have um, one more coming in January. Um, you know, if you would like to sign up, there's a quick link at the top, um, and uh, we would love to see you there. Uh, Nick, thank you so much. I really appreciate the time. Really appreciate the insights. And uh, you know the, the the magical conversation here. Um, I'm, I'm sure everybody loved the wisdom and uh, cannot wait for 2022. Sounds good, Pani. Thank you so much. Happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Happy Thanksgiving. Bye. Bye.